Today's guest is Jeff Chilton. Guys, I got so excited during this interview. Um, let me tell you a little bit about Jeff. He studied ethnomycology at the University of Washington in the late 60s. Um, and in 1973, he began a 10-year career as a large-scale commercial grower of mushrooms. Okay. Um, he's the co-author of the mushroom cultivator, which was published in 1983. He authored that with Paul Stamets. Many of you, I don't know if you followed me for a while, you may have heard me talk about Paul Stamets, who I met at the psychedelic science summit in Austin, Texas in 2019. I've been a big fan of Paul's work. Um, his, his film, um, fantastic fungi is actually amazing. Um, and so anyway, I was just like, wait, you wrote a book with Paul. Wait, what? This is so cool to be able to dive into this conversation with Jeff because, um, he really was a pioneer and not only in the sixties, like part of the, the, like the psychedelic movement, he talks about how Terrence McKenna, um, spoke at one of his mushroom conferences. He's friends with Dennis McKenna, you know, obviously knows Paul very well. Um, but man, I mean, we go into from like the psychedelic side of things. Cause yes, I am definitely ha a huge fan of psilocybin and the healing potential of, um, plant medicines, but also I love the nutritional impact of, uh, mushrooms as well. And he educated so well in this. So if you're interested, I just got to give you a heads up. If you're buying mushroom, like powders or extracts, you need to listen, like kind of towards the end of the episode, what he shares about that in detail. Um, very, very eye opening. I'm like, thank you for filling me in. I'll give you a little spoiler alert. It's mostly not even mushrooms. So <laughs> listen to that part, um, man. So in 1989, Jeff established Namex. Um, so that is his website, namex.com. That's N A M M E X.com. Um, that's where you can get his products, his research, his education podcasts. Um, so if you're into this kind of thing and you want to know more, make sure you hit his website. It's a great resource. Um, in 1997, he organized the first organic certification workshop for mushroom production in China. He's a founding member of the World Society for Mushroom Biology and Mushroom Products um, in 1994 and a member of the International Society for Mushroom Science. Um, he's, you know, a consultant at super expert level on mushrooms. So if this is something that interests you, you are going to be in for a treat. Um, let's go ahead and, and get into this. Um, oh, also, I wanted to mention um, if you want to look into the products so you can go to realmushrooms.com. So we'll link all that in the show notes and let's go ahead and get into this awesome conversation with Jeff Chilton. Okay, before we jump into the show, I've got a special announcement real quick and it is about my higher retreats. We are finally rolling on this. This is a project that's been in the work for two years for me and we are finally going. Our first higher retreat is going to be in April in Zion's National Park. I don't know if you've ever been to Zion, but oh man, it's in Southern Utah. It is incredible incredible. Check out my Instagram for pictures. If you haven't seen, it is just like one of the most magical places in the world. People come from all over the world to see this place. Um, so we are going to be doing it there April 21st through 24th, 2022. And I wanted to let you guys know, we are still in our early bird pricing right now. Um, we sold a lot of it. We filled more than half the retreat in our pre-sale, but we still have one shared room left. So if you want to come with somebody and save some money, jump on that. Um, I am doing this with be the wellness. They are helping me put on this retreat. Be the wellness is amazing. They're like my dream end goal of all retreats. And they've decided to help other people like me put on retreats. So it's going to be phenomenal. They're award-winning retreat, um, hosts and yeah, it's, it's going to be good. So you have to go to their website. It's going to be, be the wellness. So B E E make sure you follow them on Instagram, by the way, also, but B E E the wellness, be the wellness.com slash experiences slash hire. All of the details are there. You have pricing. Um, you can register right there on the website, all of the schedule, all of the people who are coming. We have a shaman coming to do a fire ceremony the first night with amazing yoga meditation, breath work facilitator, Catherine Dixon, who is like, I don't know what to call her. My like spiritual guide in life. <laughs> um, she is facilitates the work of Byron Katie and she has an episode here on inside out health. I would highly suggest listening to that. She is a life changer. She's going to be facilitating, um, two days at the retreat. So I'm so excited to have Catherine coming. She's like my secret weapon. She's amazing. So, um, yeah, all the details are on that website. Go check it out. Take advantage of the early bird pricing we have going, um, for the next, uh, week and a half. So that will end on, I guess maybe it's a little less than that by the time you hear this, that ends on August 8th at 8 PM. So eight, eight, eight. Okay. August 8th at 8 PM mountain time is when the early bird pricing ends. So if you want to get in on that, get in on that now. 
Um, and yeah, if this is something that's pinging, if you feel like you need a reset, connect to nature, connect with like-minded people, take a look inside at what you got going on and leave with some tools on how to control your stress response and challenge your stressful thoughts and find out what might be going on inside of you that you're just not seeing. This is going to be amazing. We have a sh private chef coming, all gourmet paleo meals. It's going to be incredible. So um, yeah, check that out. Bethewellness.com slash experiences slash hire. So I want to tell you guys about one of my favorite finds in the health industry in the last few years. It's something I use with all my clients and that has been extremely impacting on me as well. And that's the upgraded formulas, hair mineral tests, their consults and their nanoparticle size minerals. So um, I started on this path because I was taking in a high quality magnesium. And when I tested, I found out that I was extremely deficient in magnesium. And once I started using their nanoparticle size magnesium, my levels went right up. And what I experienced was incredible. I started getting more REM sleep. I was, I realized I hadn't been dreaming in years, started dreaming again, and also noticed that I didn't think I had anxiety until I got my magnesium back up and noticed that I was experiencing quite a lot of anxiety and that went away and I was able to enter back into a place of calm and peace. And, um, it was just incredible. And so since then I've been using it with all of my clients and it's so easy. All you have to do, they'll mail you out a little envelope and you just put some hair in it and mail it back into their lab. And then you do a consult with them over the phone and they'll tell you all about your ratios, what's high and what's low, because you can't know this unless you test. There's no way to know. And you can't just crap shoot minerals. You have to make sure that your ratios are on point. So they will tell you exactly what you need more of, exactly what you need less of to get those ratios on point. So you can have optimized brain health and hormones and sleep and metabolism. So um, they're also giving you 10% off for being an inside out health listener. So that code is just inside out. So um, go to upgradedformulas.com and just enter inside out at checkout and you'll get 10% off their consults, um, the hair tests and any products that you may need to get your ratios, right? So, um, yeah, take advantage of it, guys. It's something I use with every single one of my clients. It's been wildly impacting, and I'm happy to be able to extend that discount on to you guys too, as a thank you for listening to the podcast. All right, Jeff, I literally, from our conversation before we started, I'm like, how much time do we have? I don't know if I have enough time to ask you all of the questions. I am so beyond excited you guys for this interview. Um, wow. So let's, let's start. Can you give them some history of how you got into studying mushrooms back in the sixties? <laughs> well, you know, I, I was raised in the Pacific Northwest. I was, uh, raised in Seattle and, and what are we known for rain? <laughs> we actually have the perfect climate for wild mushrooms. One, maybe one of the best places in the world for wild mushrooms. So I was able to get out mushroom hunting early with parents of friends. And then when I went to university, University of Washington, my study was anthropology, but I also studied mycology there. And I put the two together because in my anthropological studies, I was interested in the use of mushrooms as food, as medicine, and for shamanic purposes yeah. worldwide. And look, uh, we actually had psychoactive mushrooms growing on the University of Washington campus. Wow. And, and all sort of locally, we were starting to discover them. And then I was studying their use, especially in Mexico. Mm. So, so this was kind of like, the beginning yeah. for me in terms of mushrooms and and look i i was just so fascinated by the whole thing of of um, magic mushrooms 100%. oh my goodness and and the 60s and we're doing a lot of experimentation so yeah. we're eating mushrooms and lsd and a number of those types of things and and you know it's a counterculture we're really expanding out from what was at that point a very narrow um infoscape let's just call it totally. so so then when i when I um, gra uh, graduated from university, it's like, well, what do you do with a degree in anthropology? And I thought, well, God, I'd really love to grow mushrooms. And my mycology professor said, hey, there's a mushroom farm down in Olympia, Washington. Why don't you go down there and apply for a job? I did. And I ended up there for 10 years living with mushrooms. It was a very, very big agaricus farm, but 
here's what was really awesome about it was that we had a Japanese scientist there that was growing shiitake, oyster mushroom, and a noki -taki. So I even got to see these other mushrooms grown. And that really started out my whole career in, in mushrooms. Wow. Yeah. I think anybody, you know, and we've had other guests talking about psilocybin and other plant medicines, and I'm very open about this. My, I think my audience knows by now that it is a huge part of my life. It's a, in my opinion, one of the greatest healing gifts, um, and connection to the divine and source energy. And I don't think you can have those sacred experiences without honoring and kind of adoring the gift that these little, little expressions of, you know, I, I, <laughs> I tell people it's kind of weird, but like, I look at like people say that we are all one, we are, you know, expression of the divine. And I see that as mushrooms. When you look at the mycelium network, that's underneath the ground, they're just these little expressions, these little gifts, and they give us so much, oh, not yeah. only the psychedelic, you know, like in life changing experience, but also there's all these health benefits to all the other ones. Yes. So I would love if we could go into a little bit of, you know, where your research has taken you on the health benefits of all these other mushrooms, you know, do you have well, any favorites or any insights for us? Well, well, you, you know, um, when I was at the mushroom farm for those 10 years, I was just reading so much more because in, in, in university, my study was really based around uh, shamanic use. And so mm. I was writing paper papers on religion because all of a sudden I was questioning religion. And I was yeah. like, well, well, religion really, what's the source? Why do people even have this idea? And I was like, oh, well, gee, back in the day, people had visions, they had experiences, religion yeah. sort of came up due to that. And so that's where I ended up finding the whole thing of, of, I mean, can you believe it? There's a man named Gordon Wasson um, who was studying mushrooms worldwide. And he uh, found out that in the mountains of Mexico, in the 50s, he went there and they were still using psilocybe mushrooms in their healing ceremonies. Wow. I, I mean, after 400 years of Spanish repression. Yeah. And then when you start to go deeper, you find out that they've been used for thousands and thousands of years. Now, when I, when I um, was at the mushroom farm growing mushrooms, I was just consuming so much information about, yeah. about uh, medicinal benefits. And, yeah. and this was something I also knew of in, in university, but I just got deeper into it. And then, then after leaving the mushroom farm and, and, growing mushrooms, uh, small crops and stuff on my own. In 1989, I decided, you know, fresh mushrooms, you have no idea what it means to be a mushroom farmer. Mushrooms do not sleep, Tara. They <laughs> do not, they keep growing. You have to be there with them every day of the year. Every mushroom you've ever eaten has been harvested by hand. I mean, so, so you have to have harvesters there on Christmas, on New Year's, every day of the year on a large farm. It is just like, and I just went, huh, there are these medicinal benefits of mushrooms that I've been reading about. They've been used in traditional Chinese medicine for thousands of years. Wouldn't it be easier to have something that is a dry product and I could sell that as a business out there? So I went from yeah. being producing edible mushrooms fresh to going, okay, I'm going to get into producing medicinal mushrooms. Now it's something where I can, I can sell them. They're a dried powder. They could sit on the yeah. shelf. I don't have to worry about harvesting them, babysitting them. <laughs> yeah. So, so this was a real major turning point for me. And, and mm. I, I really started uh, a lot of my research by in 1989, I went to China to the International Conference. Um, uh, it was International Society for Medicinal Mushrooms had a, 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 a conference there. And, and that just totally opened my eyes because mm -hmm. in China, they have dozens of research institutes. They have lots and lots of mushroom growers. Mm -hmm. And that's where mushroom growing started in the 12th century. They wow. started growing shiitake mushrooms. Wow. They actually have a temple 
back up in the mountains in this, what they call the mushroom county of China, a temple. Wow. And the, the statue on the large altar in this temple is the man who learned how to grow shiitake mushrooms. Wow. And he's sitting up there and in one hand, he's got a shiitake mushroom. It's wow. just amazing. And it's just kind of a, a, a interesting, small little temple, but there it is in this county. <laughs> if wow. you can imagine, it's a Buddhist temple. And here he is, Wusong Gong, sitting there with a shiitake mushroom in his hand and, and a kind of a, a little stick in the other hand, which back in the day when they wanted the mushrooms to start to produce after an incubation period, they would smack the log with this stick and try to wake it up. Come on, now's the time to start growing. But wow. can you imagine? So the whole 90s, I was going to China mm. for conferences, uh, visiting mushroom growers, visiting these research institutes, just soaking it up. And, and today, China produces over 85% of the world's mushrooms. Wow. 85%. Wow. I mean, it is just incredible. And these are all the, the beauty of it is that they're, it's done by small farmers mm. who make a really good living as just a, a, a side crop to the rice they're producing or mm. something else. And it's done way back in the mountains and even getting there is a really journey, uh, journey to get back to where they're producing these mushrooms. But it's just that sort of started me off really on my path to getting into the nutritional supplement industry, yeah. going to things like natural foods expo down in Los yeah. Angeles. And in, in like the first time I was down there in 1990 and I went down with, with uh, a reishi mushroom in hand mm. <laughs> and walking around to all these companies there and they're trying to sell their products to retailers. And I'm like, have you ever heard of uh, medicinal mushrooms? No. Um, <laughs> have you ever seen a reishi mushroom? Have a look. They're, they're looking at it like, is this real? Wow. <laughs> it feels like just a piece of wood. Yeah. It's a very woody mushroom. Wow. Uh, and then it's like, well, nobody's asking for these. Why should we bring these out of as a product, it was kind of the whole, right. you know, sort of like, why should we put a product out of there's no demand. So, so I mean, the whole 90s for me was like an educational decade. And, and, and it still is what I'm doing as mm -hmm. much as possible, just educating people about mushrooms. That was kind of like the beginning of NAMEX, which started in 1989 introducing medicinal mushrooms to the natural products industry when nobody had a mushroom product. Wow, guys, this is the guy. I like I you, uh, people who know me well are like, oh, Tara's probably in freaking heaven right now. <laughs> so let me let me back up a little bit because I actually do. You know, before we were talking, we were speaking Spanish to each other. We both speak Spanish. We both have a deep love for Mexico. I'm actually creating a new program right now, all based on Mexican history, Aztec history. Oh my god, I'm <laughs> stoked! That's I'm, amazing. Uh, yeah, I'm so, using the animal totems and using um, some of their teachings, and you know, I. I've nerded out too. Once you've experienced the healing power of mushrooms, it's like, wow, what other cultures and his, you know, what other cultures before us that we think were so advanced, but I've definitely learned that they had a lot of their own advanced ways too. And, um, I'm curious to dive a little deeper into the shamanic practices and stuff that you've learned from Mexico specifically. Um, you, you know, you mentioned that you, you co-authored your book with Paul Stamets, you know, Dennis McKenna. I mean, you really, you've been in this thing from the beginning. And so could you teach us some of the things that you've learned about the history of, of mushrooms on more of the shamanic side of things that might be interesting for people to hear? Well, well, oh my goodness. You know, when you think about it, the fact that this practice is still going on here in the fifties and, and nobody really knows about it in terms of the Western world. Mm -hmm. And then in 1938 or thereabouts, one of the top botanists from Harvard hears something about it from some source 
and he travels down to the mountains of Mexico and he talks to the people there. He gathers a few samples. He brings them back. He tests them. Sure enough, they, they are uh, active. Um, and, and he goes, okay, this is going on right now because of his work. And his name was uh, Richard Evans Schultes. Mm -hmm. He's he started his career at Harvard uh, researching the Native American church. It shows him pictures of him in the 20s standing there with the natives. Uh, and he, there he is. He's like a 23-year-old guy. Mm -hmm. And you're just thinking, oh, my God. So, and spent a lot of time in, in the Amazon. If you ever want to read more about uh, Dr. Schultes, there's a book out there called One River. The author is Wade Davis. It's an amazing book, a, 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 all about his career. So, so now there's other people out there that that then ultimately get wind of this. The fact that Dr. Schultes has found these mushrooms in Mexico, and one of them is a, a New York banker called Gordon Lawson, and he and his Russian wife have been have been researching the use of mushrooms worldwide. She's kind of interested in him in it because. Russians are totally into mushrooms. So, <laughs> so he learns about it. And for the next five summers in Mexico from 1953 to 1958, he goes down to the mountains of Oaxaca, Mexico, mm. and spends time primarily in a small community. Maybe you've heard of it. It's called Huautla. And, oh. and the, he brings a French mycologist with him. They go all through the mountains with different uh, guides. They, they um, find about 12 different species of psilocybe mushroom. And also they connect with native healers. And, and one of those healers is named Maria Sabina. I have read about amazing. Her. <laughs> um, there, there's, you know, if you if you ever get a chance, there's a book out there, and it was published in 1978. It's it's called Maria Sabina, uh, and then a subtitle. And not only does it have her history, but it has her chanting. It's got like mm -hmm. 50 pages of her chants because mm -hmm. what what happens with these native healers? What she does is is it's all at night. Um, she has an altar, and on the altar are flowers mm. there are photos of religious icons and what they've done down there is they have incorporated the catholic religion into their practices mm. so not only is she a native healer she's also a part of a local group of the church the catholic mm. church there so she's involved in the church but also is healing people and and the way they do it which is really interesting is not only does she eat the mushrooms but the person that has come to her with whatever illness it is also eats the mushrooms mm -hmm. which which is not always the case so and, and then she is chanting and this is, this is like in a darkened room, maybe with a couple of candles. Sometimes the candles are on, sometimes they're not. Um, she's got copal, which is a very powerful incense that comes from uh, pine conifer type trees. It's an ancient in, incense. And so she's burning copal in this room and she's actually running these mushrooms through the, the smoke as well. And mm. then they're consuming the mushrooms she starts to chant. She's also doing a lot of percussion on her body. No mm. drum or anything. She's using her body for mm. percussion. So she's essentially setting up um, sound waves and tones to bring her into uh, close communication and communion with not only the mushroom itself, which they say speaks, the mushroom speaks. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, 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 and she's, she's trying to discern what it is that's going on with this person there that has this mm -hmm. illness. Now that person has, 
explain to her what's happening and all of this. So, so this, this is the way they're doing their healing ceremony. And it goes on right through the night. And, and psilocybin generally has about a five hour, really strong uh, um, time on it. So, so sometimes she will uh, have a, something positive to say about how we can heal this person, because it's not necessarily just the mushroom that is, is doing any healing for this person. It's, it's a way to, to diagnose. So, and sometimes she can come out of it and say, well, gee, there's really nothing we can do for you that you hear. Um, so, so Gordon Lawson and, and his, the French mycologist have this experience down there. And, and what happens after four years, they publish an article in a broadsheet color magazine called Life Magazine. <laughs> and this is, this is one of those magazines that's like everybody reads it in the United States. It's yeah. just like the major, it's like right. Time Magazine, but yeah. it's, it's big. It's a yeah. whole big magazine, very colorful. And on the cover, what I really love, they say, great expeditions three or four they're doing a series of it and then it says mushrooms that cause visions discovered in mexico and i'm thinking how tara how innocent is that (laughs) (laughs) you know because because it was like isn't this interesting (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> yeah, for the general public, it's like you yes. get more than you bargain for. Well, You're gonna process well, all your crap. <laughs> and that just goes to show you what you know. Back in the fifties, we still hadn't reached the the drug wars and the right. prohibitions and all right. of that. Instead, back then, you know, even back then, there was a lot of interest uh, by classical scholars of what's going on in the ancient world right. and they're still looking for what was soma we need to know and and what was what were they using at eleusis in greece what was it that they were consuming right. there were still scholars that were actually interested in these subjects right <laughs> today it's like you know it's like no no nothing like that in <laughs> in university i mean there are people but still it's not like it was then when, when classical knowledge of the past was still something that people paid attention to. So here it is. He's got this article in Life magazine and it's about 10 pages long. And, and at one point you open it up and on both sides, there are beautiful watercolors of 12 different species of uh, psilocybe mushroom. How do you spell what you're saying? I don't, I have not heard of what is this? A- psilocybe is the genus and think of psilocybe and then you go, psilocybin oh, right right okay so okay. that's the genus so the genus is psilocybe got it okay yeah that's how you would pronounce it psilocybe okay. got Cuban, it for example is the main mushroom that is being cultivated today and so <clears throat> okay what what's really interesting is that then in the in the 70s uh, paul and i and two other people organized mushroom conferences in the northwest <clears throat> And, and, you know, this was like after there was a first a couple of other mushroom conferences and these conferences would bring together. um, They even brought in before uh, before ours, they brought in Albert Hofmann, the man that discovered LSD. They brought in Dr. Schultes. They brought in um, Wasson. So I met all of these people at one of the conferences in 1977. I met Albert Hofmann. Uh, I so met cool. Gordon Wasson. Um, so it was just amazing, right? Yeah. So we went up went and created four conferences and the conferences were all held in the Pacific Northwest. And we had um, people there that were teaching uh, taxonomy, how to identify mushrooms. Mm. People that were talking about uh, history of mushrooms, um, uh, <clears throat> benefits of mushrooms. My, my end of it was, was uh, doing presentations on cultivation of mushrooms. Mm. You know, so we had four conferences. The last conference we held was at Brighton Bush Hot Springs in Oregon 
they carried on with it after our conference. They carried on and had a, a conference there every year. But our keynote speaker at that last conference was Terrence McKenna. Wow. <laughs> yeah. So cool. Okay. I have to ask, like, so you, I mean, you're studying mycology in the sixties. You're, you found the, the beauty of these sacred experiences that you can have with them. What was that like going through the war on drugs? Like you've been through like the ex- initial excitement, you know, here in, in the States of like, oh my gosh, wanted something big. Then it all gets shut down. Now we're just in the process of starting to get it decriminalized again. What has that been like for you? Oh my God. It's like coming full circle. You know, yeah. you know, back then, look back then, uh, first of all, uh, cannabis is illegal. And in in, in mid sixties, all of a sudden there's a a big switch for a lot of us from, you know, any sort of alcohol to cannabis. Yeah. I mean, and all of a sudden it's like, like, wow, this is really great. And so that brings in a whole nother culture, but look, cannabis is illegal. They put people in jail for it. So we always had to be very careful and you're always looking over your shoulder Right. Knowing that you could become arrested. If, and, and in in the 60s, it was the sentences for that were not nearly as harsh as what happened later on in the 80s with Ronald Reagan. But so all through this period, not only that, but in 1965, as all of a sudden people started taking uh, psilocybe mushrooms, people started taking LSD, and now you have a lot of uh, the counterculture that is going into a lot of, let's just say mind expansion, Mm -hmm. boom, down comes the curtain and they make that illegal. And one of the things about that period in time was that we didn't have guides. We didn't have a lot of knowledge. (laughs) I've thought that. (laughs) Learn that ourselves. (laughs) Right. I'm always like, thank you. Thank you. I know it was a mess, (laughs) but thank you for just trying to. (laughs) Well, you know, so the whole, the whole concept really of set and setting. Yeah. is very important. Was something we had to learn now. Now look, certainly setting we kind of had that figured out because then a lot of times it was just like, okay, just like when we would uh, get high, a lot of times it's, it's in the evenings later, you, you know, drop yeah. acid or, take right. or smoke and you're listening to music, which was, you know, look, the music that came out of the sixties was just unbelievably <laughs> wonderful. So we're listening to music. We're just, you know, kicking back in rooms that are, are really very colorful and comfortable. And so Mm -hmm. a lot of those experiences were done in, in the right way. But Mm -hmm. again, um, okay. What happens when somebody's having a little bit of a a issue and, and they're, they're a little bit disoriented. Well, you know, back then they had what they called crisis centers where Mm -hmm. you could actually bring somebody and, and what did they do? They talked them down because it was really just a matter of, okay, look, you're not really dying. <laughs> you're right. actually just, just don't worry. This will wear off. Calm yeah. down. That's all good. So there was, there were, were um, certainly ways that this could be managed to some degree, but it didn't help that it was all illegal. And, right. and so we had prohibition starting then. And, and look, during the 70s, believe it or not, it was actually starting to loosen up a little bit. Even Seattle decriminalized uh, cannabis for a period of time until Ronald Reagan came in and mm-hmm. just, you know, it was just say no. And right. now, now we're in a situation where they're increasing penalties. They're arresting a lot of people. <clears throat> and then, then when you got into the 90s, um, with even the Clinton administration, they passed these laws that are horrible in terms of incarcerating people. And so <clears throat> even today, I believe, I think it's 50% of the people in federal prisons are uh, drug offenders. Wow. Can you imagine people that are involved? I mean, Look, I, I have a number of friends that spent time in prison for growing cannabis, for growing mushrooms. Plants. 
plants that plants, go in the ground exactly, and you're in prison exactly and, and telling us <laughs> no 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 you you cannot use this plant yeah yeah that's growing really? in nature available to everyone and I, I have to add real quick if you guys aren't familiar with set and setting set would be like your mindset and setting would be your environment and it's so imp- so so crucial um for a successful uh, uh, journey and i love what you're saying about like the illegal aspect because i've had many 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 journeys and have you know had journeys with many first timers. And one thing that I have to talk to them about beforehand is like, we have to process this, like I'm doing something bad, um, brainwashing that we've had from, you know, the just say no and all this. And I'm like, you want to just say no, say no to those pharmaceuticals that say you're going to have probable dementia in four years. If you keep Absolutely. doing that, right. And these plants are so healing. They get to the root cause of things and help you find the answers for healing from inside of you, connect you to source. They're so beautiful. And so it's like, it's, um, so I'm looking forward to a day when the, the brainwashing is gone and there's people are able to enter that space in the state with a sacred attitude that it deserves, you know? Mm-hmm. So yeah, yeah absolutely right. And I think we're, we're starting to approach that now. In fact, I, I, uh, um, um, viewed a seminar that was put on recently up here in British Columbia, and it was by a, a psychologist, a clinical psychologist, and he has a Health Canada license mm. to treat people using uh, psilocybin nice. mushrooms. Nice. And, and he was talking about the different patients he had and the experiences they had. And, and the set and setting they use, which, which, you know, I'm fine with it. It's a setting where a person is just kind of laying on a couch. They've got a mask over yeah. and uh, they're just like doing an inner journey, which I think is perfect because you, you just, you no, know, we, we, Oftentimes back then, of course, you know, you'd never do it with a mask or, but you'd have the visions of the world around you yeah. and you could certainly lay back at times and close your eyes and drift, right. drift away. Um, That's how well, I prefer I, it. Personally, well, connecting to nature is what, pretty epic. Well, that, <laughs> yeah. And, and I always think of the Beatles song, which is like, uh, turn off your mind, relax and flow downstream. Yeah. And that's yeah. kind of what one of the best ways to practice this is, is just that. So, so this is what, how they do it now in these clinical settings. And, and I'm just really encouraged that they are now using mushrooms in this way. And, and he was actually using um, actual psilocybin mushroom powder, which I thought was great because the ultimately a lot of uh, physicians, when they get into this kind of practice, they will be using uh, synthetic psilocybin, which is being mm. made out there, which is fine. Mm. I, I don't mind that. But, you know, a lot of people would like mm-hmm. to have that, that pill and they know it's 25 milligrams or whatever. What yeah. was interesting about this presentation, Tara, is that there were 70 doctors from British Columbia and other parts of Canada that were viewing this. Can you imagine 70 physicians that were interested? Okay, how are you doing this? What protocols are you are you using? What's your experience there? So so it was just like, man, this is really happening. And and Mm -hmm. and the way I look at it too is like, okay, first that's how we start. Uh, Second, it's like okay people can use it on their own without any sanctions or penalties. And, and ultimately wouldn't it be great too, if there were centers that you could go to where they would provide you with the safety of a space and maybe, maybe uh, um, guides if necessary. And, and if you like to do it in a setting with a a small group or something, a lot like what uh, in a way the ayahuasca thing is. And, and, you know, one of the things I, I will say is that I know people who are deep in the ayahuasca movement and, and I fully support it, but I'm not really that supportive of the whole idea of I'm having to fly all the way to South America and spend $3,000 on my week right. or two weeks or right. whatever down there in a, you know, whatever type of, and with who knows with 80 who, people and, and yes, it, exactly. It, well, and I have done that. I did that in Costa Rica and I, you know, I had probably had 100, 200 journeys before ayahuasca with other medicines. And I was like, this is going to be somebody's first 
psychedelic journey. This is like the mothership. This is intense. Like I don't really recommend it. If anyone's listening, I don't really recommend starting with ayahuasca. That would be like, I'm going to start meditating and trying to meditate for five hours. You know, it's just like, whoa, you might want to start like a little bit. And that's why I love mushrooms because I think they're such a beautiful introduction to plant medicines. It's definitely going to take you out of your normal, but it's not like, you know, I've had friends, they were like, felt like they were getting pulled by vines and snakes under the ground and dying on ayahuasca. I mean, that's like kind of intense, you know? So, um, anyway, I, and I love what you're saying. I I fully would want to eventually someday be able to hold space like that with mushrooms and connect people to nature. And that's part of the reason I'm, you know, we, we talked about how we, we both donate to maps and I went to maps conference in um, Austin, as I was telling you in 2019, and I, I tell people all the time, I'm like, this was called the psychedelic science summit. So who do you think was there? You think it was a bunch of like losers and hippies or what? Nope. It was, um, almost completely, almost exclusively doctors, therapists, neurologists, neuroscientists, health coaches, high level crowd. And they're all saying, how can we help? How can we do this intelligently? What's the latest? We all are so grateful to Rick Doblin for what he's been doing. You know, he's been fighting for this for so long and we finally got FDA granted breakthrough therapy designation for psilocybin. So now they're doing that research at Johns Hopkins and, and there's more coming. So I, I'm just like, seriously, I, with you, I'm like, ah, like you, you were there from the beginning and you're getting to see this all roll out and it's happening so rapidly right now. You know, I think, uh, I'm sure you're more on it than I am. I know Oregon decriminalized and, uh, something just happened in California went on the ballot for legalization, I believe not just decriminalization of psilocybin. And then I think it was Maine or one of those States over there has is, got it decriminalized and it's rolling now. So it is rolling. And look, my, my, <laughs> good friend Dennis McKenna has what he's called the McKenna Academy Mm. and the McKenna Academy is all about creating these places and spaces where you can go and they've got Mm. libraries and people and you can have uh, experiences there. And he, he envisions those in different parts of the world. And I'm really encouraging him to put something like that in British Columbia. And, you know, and what's really interesting to me when you talk about coming full circle is, you know, my business is right now, the actual business itself is in functional mushrooms, medicinal mushrooms. And, and right. we're, um, that's our focus because, you know, obviously, you know, that's not legal to be selling psilocybe mushrooms or anything like that. But we've right. had probably, I don't know, eight or 10 different companies come to us and they want to talk to me because they're, they're creating companies yep. preparing for psilocybin yep. to be legal. And, uh, you know, and, and look, in, in British Columbia, a, lo- a lot of these companies are in British Columbia because in, in Canada now, you can actually get a, a license to either produce uh, on a certain level or you get a license if you want to use it in a practice. So British Columbia has been ki- is kind of like, <laughs> the central focus these days. Unfortunately, uh, a lot of these companies are actually like, okay, we just got off the cannabis train and it yeah. made us a ton of money. Totally. Now we want to get on that psilocybin train. Yep, I've, and, I've... and so, you know, <laughs> I, I listen to them. Some of them want me to, you know, fly off to Jamaica to help them grow mushrooms and others want them me to be on an advisory board and all of this. And I'm kind of like, you know, no, I, I don't, I don't think so. We'll just sort of kind of sit back and do, what we want to do. And, and we may get involved on a certain level on our own terms and how we do it. Yeah. But, but really, uh, my, I really hope that it doesn't go that route where it's just mm-hmm. a gold rush because uh, that's just so counter to what I, it, what it is. Yeah. And I, I, unfortunately I feel like it's gonna, <laughs> but, and I think that's why education is so important. You know, I have a friend here who, um, you know, is a, she serves, um, combo and some other medicines and she was, you know, she's very much into the, um, I guess, anthropological anth- anthrop- anthropological, anthropological. Yes, yeah. the side of things. And she was, you know, educating me and I really appreciated it. And she's like, you know, the, the mushrooms, many mushrooms are grown like with love and beauty with like small farmers. And, you know, a lot of them are shamanic or healers. And then you have 
you could just get mushrooms from somebody who grew it in a tub in their garage, you know? And, um, <laughs> she's like, there's a difference. She's like, I feel a difference on the energy. And I appreciated her, um, educating me on that, you know, of like thinking about, like, we think of food, right. We think of food as like, do you want something that came out of a factory and was just like cranked out and pumped out and, yeah, you know, yeah, maybe wasn't yeah. grown in the best way, or do you want something that was pasture raised, organic grown with love, you know? And I, I think it's important to think about that too, as these things become legalized is like, where did it come from? What was the source? Oh yeah, I, I totally agree. And, and I, I would, I would really love it instead of just allowing these monster big farms and, you know, this is the whole industrial agriculture right. kind of right. model. And I really reject that. And we have to yes. go, what I say sometimes is we have to go back to the future, not yeah. the way that we're moving now. We need to look back. And this is something actually that that uh, Terrence McKenna talked about, he called it the archaic revival. Mm. And what he meant was that we are learning a lot from looking back at yeah. how these plants were used in the past. And, mm. and I, I think that's absolutely right because we're not looking for some kind of high tech solution. I, I mean, think about it for a minute. Where, where are a lot of people going to go for these kind of experiences? Well, they'll go to some company that puts on some virtual reality glasses and they lay back on a couch with these virtual reality glasses and that that's their trip. Mm. It's like, no, 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 no. That, that's not where we want to go. Yeah, that's you know, controlling. That play, well, well, if you want to do that to play a game or something, fine, but come right. on. Right. Yeah. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm very big into the regenerative agriculture movement. Oh, good for you. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I've got an event at a ranch coming up at the end of this month with a, a rancher that I work with and, and love. And, you know, I, I think of this also with, with mushrooms, it's like, let's not dishonor the gift that mother earth has given us by ruining mother earth with it, you know? So. <laughs> no, absolutely right. I mean, just like regenerative agriculture. I mean, are you familiar at all with like permaculture? I mean, that's kind of where a lot of it has come from, right? And I remember back yeah. in the eighties when I had friends that were deeply involved in permaculture mm -hmm. back then when it was just kind of getting started and and they brought a guy from Australia named Bill Mollison, who was like one of the major figures in permaculture who helped to develop it all. And he came to, I mean, geez, Washington state at that time was just a hotbed of mushrooms and mm -hmm. permaculture mm -hmm. and everything. There were, there were so many people coming together, then it was just fantastic. And, and mm -hmm. it did kind of, um, you know, get sidetracked a little bit from the change in administrations, but still it carried on to the point where, where we are today. And, and look, this whole high tech thing. I mean, it's great that we can sit here and talk over zoom and all of that, but there is a limit to that. We have to, to um, be aware that we need to keep our feet on the yes. ground, our hands in the earth and yes. be connected to that and not lose that connection because there are people out there that they could care less. They, they're happy mm -hmm. to be in concrete and yeah. in, they machines. Think they are. And in a sense, it's the, it's the difference between a machine person and a person that's more of a nature lover. And that's, that's what we have to be. And that's what's going to ultimately carry us to the future in the, in the, the right way, rather yeah. than all of these machines. And oh, yeah, technology is going to save us on and on and on. It's like, no, it's not, not no. at all. We just yeah. have to stop consuming. We have yeah. to live a simpler life we have to get yeah. go back to the future here. And the, the easiest way, actually I'm, so I'm starting retreats next year. And the reason I'm starting them is because I was out in the desert on psilocybin and I was instructed, stop telling people about this and provide experiences for them to come out in nature and experience this connection themselves. Because once you re tap into what matters, all of these, it, it just, it aligns you. You start to become more interested in helping mother earth. You start to get your senses about you. We get so disconnected from it. And our little boxes, I say, we made really, really awesome shelters. They're so good. They have Wi-Fi and they're climate controlled and they have refrigerated food <laughs> and 
coffee makers and like washing machines. Like we made some really dope shelters, but then we yeah. made them so good that we're missing half the show. We're missing oh. who we are. We're missing that connection. And I'm like, when was the last time you got outside at night and saw the night sky? You don't no. have to wait for camping to do that. Don't exactly. Exactly. <laughs> However, I will say this, if you're an urbanite, forget it. Right? I know too I much mean, light that, pollution. And that's part of the problem is that there's too many people that are, that are in the urban centers and Nobody is, no. is going, hey, did you know it's a full moon tonight? Let's just go out there and we'll just watch the full moon and sit there and watch the stars and all that. This is something that when I was traveling in Mexico back in the early 70s, it was like every full moon, it was like a major event. And right. we were all going to get together as the moon right. came up. It was right. just like, no, this was something we followed i still follow that and and <laughs> i'm waiting for that full moon to come and i've got a, a a home where i live here where i've got a perfect view of the east so i get to watch the sun it come rise. up and watch the moon come up yeah i know i'm like i i just i was just in joshua tree with a couple of my friends and we were out at giant rock i don't know if you've ever been there but it is no. a special i guess they say shamans used to talk to um extraterrestrials there like anciently right so it's, yeah, this, it's the yeah. biggest freestanding boulder in the world really powerful energy we went out there at night because i had gone by myself and i was like guys we got to go after dinner i don't care like I, i'm not giving you a choice like we're <laughs> you you can't we can't leave without you seeing giant rock and we sat out there and watched this the moon rise you know and i i see that i live in utah and um i'm outside a lot and even in the evening and i i you know my friends had never witnessed that they were like wait it's like rising like the sun it's like I'm like, yeah, you know, and we miss that. We miss that magic. And when we, when we don't connect to it, we get so off base. We get so caught up in our own stuff. You know, it's like, whoa, like we cannot sustain the planet the way it's going right now. I'm not like some, I'm like, I'm not trying to be some tree hugger, like activist. It's just reality. Actually, it's just reality. And we like to pretend and just think, no, no, no. I'll just still be able to go to the grocery store and get all this food from these monocrops that are making me (laughs) sick. And I'll just keep doing that forever. It's like, no, actually wake the F up. Our kids and their kids are not going to have that if we don't change something. So anyway, I'm getting on my soapbox. Well, well, no, no, that's fine. You know, you know, no, it's like, it's like, look, one of the things that, that has really bothered me during this whole COVID thing is like, why is nobody talking about natural immunity? Why is nobody talking about prevention? Why are there not people on the street corners handing out vitamin D to everybody? Exactly. You know, it is just like, why aren't we talking about what's in the middle aisles in that grocery store that people are eating and now they are very unhealthy because of what they're eating? Why aren't we talking about know. that? Because know. that is a huge factor in what's going on. And that, you know, my business is based around providing mushroom products to people that will help potentiate their immune system. Yeah, because they're one what, of the... Well, that's what my business is based on. And I've been in the natural products industry for 30 years and lived a a life kind of based on that before that. And now all of a sudden it's like, no, no, you've got to believe in uh, big pharma and you've got to go get your shot. And then afterwards we're going to give you a booster and, and uh, thank, and everybody's going to be like, thank you, Bill Gates. And I know, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm with you a hundred percent. I mean, um, you know, and I tell people all the time, I'm like, mushrooms are one of the only ways you can get vitamin D from a food source. Your whole immune system is dependent on vitamin D. I actually got COVID. I was barely sick for two days. I hyperdosed vitamin D. I was taking 150,000 IU of vitamin D for three days. It was nothing. I did. I lost my taste for two days. It came right back, you know? Well, and- well what a wonderful story that is. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and vitamin D is one of those things. And look, let me just, let me just say something here really quickly. Mushrooms do not contain a lot of vitamin D. But don't they help you potentiate Vitamin well, D no, no, body? just a second. Let me just explain yeah, what's me. going on here because what, what, the reason the reason people think mushrooms have a lot of vitamin D, it's like mushrooms have a compound in them called ergosterol. Okay. And ergosterol is the fungal sterol, just like cholesterol for us. So uh-huh. the way that we produce vitamin D and we produce vitamin D is we have this cholesterol, the sun, the UV rays yeah. uh, on our skin, that turns the cholesterol into a pre-vitamin D3 and that's where right. we get our vitamin D. Uh With mushrooms, you have to expose them to UV light. Uh And then that ergosterol turns into a vitamin D, D2. So, so, and we actually have 
a vitamin D product based on mushroom powder that we sell. And we're setting up to do that in a bigger way. But what you have to do is you have to expose it to UV light to actually turn that ergosterol into the vitamin D. That's what you have to do. And, that, and that's where, like, if, if you were to slice your mushrooms before you ate them, your fresh mushrooms, you put them out into the sunlight for 30 minutes, that would definitely raise up the vitamin D level in those mushrooms. Now, not to the point where you could go, okay, that's giving me what I want. And I, I listened to what the man I considered the, the vitamin D expert, the, the major expert in the world, his name is Dr. Michael Hollick, and he's written some great papers on it. And he, he basically says 5,000 I use a day, period. Okay. That's what you need to be okay. taking. And especially for us, uh, I don't know, um, you know, a lot of people are in the Northern climates and we're yeah. not getting enough vitamin D. We're covered yeah. up a lot of the time. And then we got sunscreen on the rest of the time and <laughs> we're not getting enough vitamin D. So we should all be supplementing with vitamin D. Yeah. Absolutely. And yeah. we are uh, going to be producing our vitamin D2 from mushroom powder on a large scale by next nice. year. Uh, but we do have a vitamin D from mushroom powder product right now on the real nice. mushroom side. And, and, and look, if you look at the way vitamin D3 is produced, you will not be happy because D3 is produced with a process that's got a lot of chemical steps in there really? to actually um, extract it from the, the lanolin that's the source, the general source of it. Whereas think about this, it's mushroom powder, you expose it to UV, boom, that's it. It's amazing, simple process. Are, so are you saying if we buy mushrooms from the store, they won't have very much D2? Exactly. They will not have much D2. No. Unless we expose them to- Exactly. The they, mushrooms do not have reasonable huh. levels of vitamin D. Wow. They just don't. So the powders that you're going to provide, you will expose them before packaging them. Is that what I'm understanding exactly correctly? right? Yeah, we we run them through mm -hmm. a, a chamber with a, a very powerful UV light that cool. essentially um, covers them and uh, turns that ergosterol into the vitamin D2. Awesome. Okay, great. This is awesome because I just did a client's blood work the other day and her D2 was low. So I'm like, yay, answers. Um, okay, so um, speaking of products, I want to dive into this real quick. Do you mind speaking about, because there's all these mushroom powders, there's all these mushroom tinctures and, you know, it's becoming very popular. I have several in my cabinet right here. And can you educate us a little bit on what to know <laughs> from an insider's point of view about these products that are out? Right now. Oh, oh yeah, yeah, and, and this is very, very important because <clears throat> um, one of the things about mushrooms that that we're looking for are beta glucans. Beta glucans are what make mushrooms medicinal. They're what potentiate our immune system. Now, uh, it's the mushroom itself that has been used traditionally for thousands of years. When you go looking for a psilocybin mushroom, you're going to eat the mushroom, right? <laughs> okay. mm -hmm. Well, mushrooms are expensive to produce. So, so mm -hmm. if I take my mushrooms, uh, my fresh mushrooms to the marketplace, my fresh agaricus or shiitake, and they give me $5 a pound, great. But supplements are dried powders. I have to dry those mushrooms out. They're 90% mm -hmm. water. Now mm -hmm. what I get $5 for, I've got to get $50 for. Right. The economics in North America does not work for growing mushrooms and putting them into the supplement market. The mm -hmm. economics are not there. So what, mm -hmm. what do people do? Well, um, qu quickly... There is uh, a mushroom, this organism we call a mushroom, starts with a spore. The spore goes out in nature, it lands on the ground, on wood. When multiple spores germinate, they germinate into a very fine filament. Those filaments fuse together and create a network. That network is called mycelium. That is what we call the vegetative body. We never see the mycelium. You know, you've heard about mycelium and all, but we never see the mycelium because it's under the ground, it's embedded in its food source. It's in a piece of wood. You see a mushroom and you go like, that wasn't here yesterday. Where'd that come from? Yeah. <laughs> What's right. going on? Well, you know, so that vegetative body is under the ground. You don't see it. Up comes the mushroom. Well, what has happened because growing mushrooms is so expensive in the United States is companies will sterilize grain 
they will inoculate it with mycelium and grow out the mycelium on this grain until the grain is completely covered with mycelium. And you look at it and it's all white from mycelium. They will then dry that out, grind it to a powder, grain and all, and they will sell that into the market as mushroom. And, and, and the fact of the matter is, there's no mushroom in there. There's only a small amount of mycelium. And in 2015, I did a very large study. I bought 40 of those types of products off of the internet. Mm. I also had dried mushrooms. I had our mushroom extracts. Awesome. I tested them all for beta glucans. And in this beta glucan test, it also will have the amount of alpha glucan. Alpha glucan are starches. Mm. Alpha glucan is also glycogen, which mushrooms have. So when I tested these products, a mushroom or mushroom extract will normally be 30 to 60% beta glucan. And it will be less than 5% of this alpha glucan, which just shows up a little bit of it in, in the mushroom mm -hmm. or the mushroom extract. These products where the mycelium was grown on the grain, 30 to 60% alpha glucan, wow. which are the starches and approximately 5% beta glucan. Wow. The exact opposite of what you are looking for. In fact, some of these products had close to like one or 2% beta glucan. Oh and some gosh. of them were as high as 70% alpha glucan, which is the starch, which basically wow. proved what I was observing, which is these products are mostly the grain starch that the mycelium is grown on. And some of the most popular brands on the marketplace are produced in this way. And the worst part about it is they are mislabeled. So when you see that bottle, it will say reishi mushroom, maitake mushroom, right. turkey tail mushroom, a picture of the right. mushroom. Right. And you think you're buying a mushroom product. And, and all of their informational materials were talk about mushroom, 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 right. all the great benefits of the mushroom when they're selling you grain starch. Dude, and, 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 <laughs> let me give you, let me give your listeners one tip too, is that yes, you can actually in your own home, you can uh, uncover this by buying a simple bottle, little bottle of iodine, hmm. iodine, reacts with starch. So you take whatever product you happen to have right now and go, Is, do I have one of those products? Well, quarter cup of water, empty out about five or six capsules, mix it really good in the water, let it soak really well, 10 drops of iodine. If there is starch, that water will turn black. Wow. If you put a real mushroom product in there, it will just look like the color of the iodine. It will not turn because that mushrooms do not contain starch. <laughs> so, wow. This so, is huge, especially because so much of my community is keto and paleo and tries to avoid starches. This is like good to know you might just be eating grain. Oh my God. <laughs> I, I go to I go to a conference um called Paleo FX. I love Paleo FX. I actually just interviewed Keith and Michelle Norris who run Paleo FX the interview before you. <laughs> oh, well, well, see, so, and, and they've got my booth there and we're hanging out, oh, and, you know, and people nice. come up and they say, oh, mushrooms. I love mushrooms. I'm taking <laughs> a great mushroom product right now. And I'm like, oh, okay, cool. That's, that's fantastic. What's the brand? Yeah. They tell me the brand and I say, I hate to tell you this, but you are consuming mostly grain and not <laughs> Paleo <mushroom."> effects. <laughs> and they're like, Oh my God. <laughs> That's going to be the most agitated crowd ever to hear that. And that is so good to know. I'm like, go figure, go figure with free deceptive labeling. Oh, 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 <laughs> it, it is horrible. And, and look, um, a lot of the products out there will not, I mean, some of them, you can turn it over in the supplements facts. Maybe it'll say mycelium. Maybe in the fine print other, it will say myceliated grain, myceliated rice, mm something like that. But oftentimes it will not, it will just be talking about mushroom, mushroom, mushroom. It's, this is the mushroom. Mm. 
Mm. when it's not mushroom at all. It's very, very deceiving. Guys, I got to say, if you want Jeff's products, his website is N-A-M-M-E-X, Namex.com. He has mushroom extracts on there. You have a lot of education, research. I'm, I'm assuming that article, I mean, that study that you just said is on your research se- section of your website. I'm going to yes. pull it up and link it below too, because I know my people are going to be like, I want to read that. I want to see. Um, and also, I just wanted to hit on your book real quick too. Um, could you share a little bit about who might be interested? in this book that you co-authored with Paul? The Mushroom Cultivator? Yeah. Well, well, you know what? The interesting story about that is, is all during the 70s, um, most people were out looking for wild psilocybin yeah. mushrooms. Yeah. Right? And, then, and then in the mid-70s, a couple of books were produced, small little books that talked about how to grow psilocybin mushrooms in jars. And, and, and in I, jars? I was, yeah, like in mason jars. Yeah, Okay. And, and a very simple process. And a lot of people were doing it in their closets and stuff like uh-huh. that, but nobody was actually, none of the people doing this had any real cultivation experience. And so, you know, when I met Paul, he was doing the same thing, growing them in jars and he was, you know, a student there. And so we got together and he'd already written a book at that point in time, Slossom mm-hmm. Mushrooms and their allies. Yeah. And we uh, collaborated and basically brought, um, with my experience at the mushroom farm, commercial experience nice. brought actual techniques to growing mushroom that were based on hundreds of years of cultivation so awesome. experience by, you know, actual commercial cultivators. And so, so when that was published, it literally revolutionized the growing of, of mushrooms and especially in the psychoactive community. And, and all yeah. of a sudden, you know, th- this is the funny thing, Tara, is that all of a sudden, there were fewer and fewer and fewer people out in the fields looking for wild mushrooms and everybody's was now starting to cultivate. And my God, right now in terms of worldwide cultivation of, for example, Psilocybe cubensis, I mean, there's hundreds of thousands of, of uh, kilos and probably hundreds and hundreds of tons of these mushrooms are being produced worldwide. And yeah. a lot of that really kind of started with, that book, The Mushroom Cultivator so in 1983. Amazing. Yeah, 1983, you guys. Man, I, I literally, I feel like I just like struck the podcast interview lottery today. Like this topic <laughs> is so deep to my heart. I'm like obsessed. I'm like every single thing that you have put out, I'm going to be rabbit holing on. So thank you so much for oh, you're welcome. sharing Absolutely. with us today. I know so many of my audience are going to be like, Oh my gosh. So, um, do you ever, do you, are you, do you have any speaking events or events that you're going to be at that people might be able to find you at? Well, you know, I don't do a whole lot of that. The fact of the matter okay. is, is that these days what's happening is that, is that I've got my sons working for me in the business and I'm slowly pulling out of the business because yeah. you know what my passion is, uh, Tara, is um, fly fishing for trout in rivers. Amazing. <laughs> so, and you deserve it. You've been working hard. <laughs> and, and, and in the wintertime, I fly to Argentina mm. and, and I spend my winters in Argentina which is, is why, you know, my Spanish is kept up to speed. Yeah, yeah. And, and uh, so, so for me, pretty much um, I, I'm here, I will podcast, I will deal with bigger companies that come in to looking for our products. I'll be yeah. talking to them. And we have, I mean, you cannot imagine the, the uh, companies that we sell to these days. I mean, I mean, uh, I, some of them I can't mention, but one of them that we sell to, believe it or not, and, and you know, whether you like it or this company or not, because they're, you know, it's um, yeah. <laughs> on certain levels, it's like, okay, it's a multinational Nestle. Wow. I, wow. I mean, that's just the level of, you know, we deal with some of the biggest companies in the world right now. They are actually looking down and they're looking at, let's just say the, the, the beverage part of a store and they're going, wow, look at all these interesting beverages and they've got herbs, they got mushrooms. We want to get on board. Yeah. Yeah. So, that, well, that's so. great news. You know, I remember when I saw, um, I love Mark Sisson's primal kitchen products because they're yes. avocado oil based and high quality. And I remember I, I hate Walmart. I hate it. My kids oh, know oh, if, if I, if I somehow I'm in a situation where I get forced to go in Walmart, they're like, Ooh, mom's going to be mad. You know, it just like sucks the soul out of me. I'm like, oh, I don't want to give them a penny. It's like everything. I've been there once in my life. That's, <laughs> that's it. 
but I was, I, I, I was out of town. I was walking through and I, I was like, it's okay. I can breathe, you know, <laughs> but I look over in the salad dressing aisle and it catches my eye and I see primal kitchen ranch on the aisle. And it was like, it made me so happy. You know, I was like, Hey, you know what, if we can get, get that into Walmart, like it's at least it's a, it's a step to reach more people with high quality things. So, you know, sometimes I think when people have massive distribution, it's like, let's try to get as many of the good things as we can yeah, in those stores. Yeah. Yeah, no, or I totally obliterate understand. them. <laughs> I totally understand. Yes. I mean, I go into Walmart or something. I'm just disoriented. I'm like, let me out of here. <laughs> it's like a nightmare. It's like you guys, people think a psychedelic trip is like scary. It's like, walking yeah, Walmart. No, yeah, that's right. A Walmart is really scary. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, Jeff, thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing your time today. It was like an honor to meet you. I hope that you will branch out sometime of your fly fishing and come speak in another event. And I maybe I can hear you or, or, or sure, meet you in person. Sure, so. sure, yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much, Tara, for having me. It's really been enjoyable talking to you. It's really been my pleasure. Thank you. And, thank you. And guys, we'll link everything in the show notes. We'll have his website. That's namex.com. Um, the link to his book, products, research, all that. So just watch for that. And again, Jeff, thank you so much. Thank you, Tara.